I think we're all a little tired. It's been a wonderful day. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon, and thank you all for staying. Um, I'm Jerry Friedland, as you heard, and I'm one of the um, uh, co-directors of, of this uh, course, and this is my final one after 30 years. Um, and um, we thought that it would be And I, I think I have to return the applause to you. Because we're all doing this together, aren't we? That's one of the very special things about HIV. We're actually half an hour ahead of schedule. I know that. Yeah. No, okay. we said that we were going to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we thought because this is, um, this is the um, beginning of the fifth decade of the HIV AIDS epidemic, the sort of iconic beginning, which you hear was really not the beginning in New York, uh, was in June of 1981 with five men of sex with men uh, in Los Angeles. But um, we were experiencing the epidemic here before we knew it was happening. And you'll hear some about that. We thought that it would be um, useful. We're all old timers. We've been around since the beginning of the pandemic, some of us are retiring or retired, um, but it's been so much a part of our personal and our professional lives. And I would guess that the same is true of you, that um, it might be useful, both um, informative and memorable and a collegial way to actually think and remember those early days of the HIV epidemic in the early first decades and what it was like and what it felt like particularly and how we both struggled and um, with the challenges and also the successes in those early years and what they were and conclude in some way with um, how what we learned working with HIV and people living with HIV and dying with HIV has been useful in terms of approaching the next pandemic that has now ascended in our lives, um, COVID, and possibly the next one after that. So this is a more experiential and um, um, exploration of those early days uh, with that in mind. So I'm gonna moderate it, but um, I think the liftings can be done by the people at the table. Um, these are, uh, and what I'd like to do is um, ask each panelist to introduce him or herself, um, what they're doing now and what they did at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, that is where they were in New York, um, uh, what stage of training were they or where they were as faculty or um, just the beginning of their careers mm -hmm. and the effect that HIV has had on them since then. And um, I should tell you that we, um, I was in the Bronx at the time. Um, <laughs> Donna Futterman was there and so was Kathy. So we were all together, yeah. but um, Sheldon Landesman who you meet was in Brooklyn and Fred, um, um, Valentine was in Manhattan. So we were pretty spread out over the entire city, not every place, but um, well enough to actually be able to represent it in different places at the same time. So I'm gonna ask people to introduce themselves. Um, I'll start with my left and Donna, and what are you doing now? And what were you doing when HIV came? Um, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, and uh, thank Donna and the IAS staff and Jerry, who was, you know, an early, early hero in HIV and who I've always learned so much from. I'm currently a professor emeritus of pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I retired last October after 32 years at the Adolescent AIDS Program at Montefiore. And um, I became involved in HIV right at the beginning. I was in medical school. I started in 81 at Einstein. And before I started medical school, I'd been an activist in women's health and gay health. And we had a committee that was advising the mayor and the DOH on um, 
H on LGBT health. So I saw very early on the uh, start of the epidemic in our community. And I really felt it was my people in our community. And it became very clear early on that this was going to be the gay health agenda for a very long time, that it was going to wipe out everything else we were doing and looking at. Um, as I said, I was in medical school and uh, one of the people in our gay group at Einstein was Professor Frank Lilly, who was a virologist and cancer virologist who had studied retroviruses. And he was very, you know, early on convinced this was a retroviral disease and understood it and was part of the first, I guess, presidential advisory committee. And so I became very early on involved in HIV and AIDS, went to the first uh, CDC conference in Atlanta, and um, I uh, it was it was hard to be a medical student because I felt I had to have delayed gratification. I wanted to just jump in and make this be my life because I saw so many people were, but I knew I had to continue my training and I was very invested in it. Uh, fourth year elective, I worked for Jerry and went on rounds with him and saw my very first HIV positive patient, a young Latino gay man in the Bronx who was really dying of, of AIDS. And all he kept saying to me was, I wish I wasn't gay. I would pray away being gay to not have this. And it was very dramatic how much that internalized homophobia was affecting him and was all he could think about and was quite sad. Um, moving on, I'm not gonna go into a whole career, but I went into pediatrics for my residency. By then it was very clear it was also a pediatric disease. One of the earliest discoveries um, that Jerry and his team made was that this was not committed, I mean, transmitted casually within families. And that was such a relief, but people really didn't get it. And I think we're gonna have a chance to talk about the reaction of other medical providers in right. further questions, but that right. was okay, my beginning thanks. in this. So Kathy, can you? So I'm Kathy Anastas at, um, <laughs> I'm currently the professor of medicine of epidemiology and population health and of women's health at OBGYN at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I, um, for many years, was a primary care provider for uh, people living with HIV in a um, integrated general medical setting. So not in an ID clinic, but in a general medical clinic. Uh, most of that in the Bronx and the, and the South Bronx. I also currently do a lot of work in Central Africa in five countries, but most in the country of Rwanda. Um, at, the, at the time that HIV hit, um, but there is this well of grief for those of us who, who worked and it always starts to, makes me start to cry. So if, I, so if I'm teary, forgive me. Um, I was a, a second year resident in social medicine at Montefiore Medical Center at the time when the Bronx was among the early communities hit with uh, HIV. And it was an incredibly intense time emotionally, uh, very similar really to what happens, what's happening now with the pandemic, especially what the pandemic was like in New York, the COVID pandemic in March, April, May of 2020. It was that level of medical intensity. I had entered medicine as a vehicle for social change, not quite, and I wasn't quite sure how that would work. Um, but certainly the HIV epidemic was one way. I was a primary care doc. I graduated from my training program. I became a primary care doc at Bronx, Lebanon uh, and lived, dealt with the intensity of so many people. I think what, what, what may be hard to imagine is we didn't we didn't know what HIV was when it first happened. So we just knew young people were coming in dying. We figured it was infectious. We knew which groups of people were getting it, but we weren't giving primary care them. We were, we, people came in dying, dying, and they maybe would recover enough to go home for a little bit. 
and then they would die, everybody, everyone we were able to diagnose. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Okay. We'll come back to some of that because I really want to ask everyone to describe their first encounter with HIV and um, we'll hear that. Uh, uh, Sheldon? Sure. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. And thank uh, the organizers here, Donna, and, uh, Jerry, and all the rest for the privilege of uh, telling you what the early years were about. Uh, currently, I'm a professor of medicine at uh, Downstate Medical Center in the Infectious Disease Division, although I only work two days a week because I'm partially retired. And most of my work these days has been in medical education. Uh, an answer to your question perhaps earlier, uh, my first AIDS patient that I saw, but didn't know it, okay, was actually in 1978. I was just a junior faculty person just starting at Kings County Hospital. And for those of you from New York know, it's, in, it's one of the uh, safety net hospitals in Brooklyn, uh, serving a largely urban inner city uh, underserved minority. And uh, on my first month on the wards, uh, the students presented to me a couple of cases or the residents presented. Uh, one of them, actually several of them, were people who had come from Rikers Island, which is a big New York City prison, uh, who had fever, lymphadenopathy, and weight loss. We worked the patient up as you would normally do. We looked for Hodgkin's disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, tuberculosis. All of it was negative. We send them back out with a presumptive diagnosis of TB uh, to be treated. For, treated, for treatment. The house staff, ever irrelevant, irrelevant um, and, uh, and, and cynical, called it Rikers Island adenopathy. So that's what we saw in 1978. What we were probably really seeing was AIDS-related complex. And that sort of uh, started my career, although I didn't know it was started. Uh, fast forward uh, three years, obviously, we, we started picking up a lot of the patients. Uh, Kings County uh, and the downstate area serves a group of uh, immigrants, a group of uh, people who have a history of IV drug use. Uh, it didn't serve very many uh, people who were bisexual or gay, and our population was almost exclusively in the in the minority uh, minority community who had fewer little resources to handle the, the multiple diseases uh, that that they got. Um, and I worked in that for about uh, 25 years. And then um, after setting up clinics and doing a bunch of research on uh, ethical issues and uh, epidemiology, uh, I ended up uh, doing medical education. Thanks, Sheldon. And down the line, Fred Valentine from so NYU. My first encounter with HIV occurred one evening in November of 1980. I was the attending physician. Uh, I was basically doing immunology funded by the IB. And Jeff Green, who was one of our best ID fellows, called me in because he couldn't figure out a patient's pneumonia. It was a young gay man and we saw a lot of STDs in a great population, of course. And at Bellevue, we also saw a lot of IB drug users. This first man was a gay man who became short of breath. He was a really sharp fellow. He could quantify his dyspnea by the number of subway stairs he had to climb before he <laughs> got short of breath. Very observant man. Uh, he clearly had an unusual pneumonia. He was quite sick, hypoxic. Uh, his chest ex examination revealed very little almost. And as so often happens when the attending is called in by a good fellow, I had nothing much more to add, uh, except that he was sick and uh, a few crackles, but not much on exam. The chest X-ray was not terribly helpful. There certainly was no lumbar consolidation to account for his dyspnea. Uh, I did notice when it went over the physical with Jeff that he had a purplish brown spot on his left shoulder. And I said, Jeff, when his oxygenation gets better, we should biopsy that it doesn't look right, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, we did not make a diagnosis. Then we made one the next morning with bronchoscopy, which showed nothing, and a biopsy, which did show pneumocystis and gene sustained. 
We treated him with pentamidine, and over the next two weeks, he got better. Only to suddenly spike a fever and get short of breath beyond belief. We grew bud cultures and grew out cryptococcus from his blood. Now, I'd seen an occasional cryptococcal meningitis, but I'd never drawn it from the blood. And we treated him within 12 hours with amphotericin. He died. Uh, and I have slides that I made of the post-mortem exam and in one high-powered field that summed up what we all have seen subsequently. One high-powered field on the microscope, he had a big HIV, a big CMV inclusion. He had all his alveoli filled with cryptococcal yeast forms. He had a slight slits of red cells at the bottom of the same high-powered field, which obviously were capacies. And if I turn this stage a little bit more, he also had some HIV. I mean, some- uh, uh, TB. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, another herpes virus. So herpes this postmodern said that we had a, a gay man with multiple opportunistic infections and to an immunologist, they were infections that we normally associate with cell needed immunity. Mm -hmm. Only then when we looked at him, did we go back and look and say, Yes, as lymphocytes were really meager. It didn't occur to us initially. So we felt right away that we had a depression, uh, a compromise in cellular immunity. Our third patient, Jeff thinks it was our second patient, was an IV drug abuser. Now, it turned out in retrospect, that this man was not just shooting up, that he also was selling sex. But, but we were misled for, in a good direction. <laughs> Uh, because we then postulated that it was an infectious thing and had sort of a hepatitis type of, of uh, epidemiology. Closer. Uh, and that led us into a, a very long story, most of which yes. you know. We'll get to it. Uh, struggling <laughs> with the OIs, we became quite good at it. Yes. We still did not know what the etiologic agent was, yes. but we had some very strong thoughts. I don't know whether you talked about the various postulates at the time that people were throwing out as to what the cause of this was. Yes. So um, I'm going to ask us to address the audience, not me, <laughs> because this is really for you all. We know each other. We work together well. We experienced this. But I think we want you to, if we can, um, grasp what it was like in the early days. Um, uh, I guess I'll tell you my story. Um, um, I came to uh, work in the back to New York in 1981. I had worked in Boston, trained in infectious diseases in public health and Africa in the Middle East and thought I really knew a lot about infectious diseases and had seen everything. And in July of that year, um, I was making it um, infectious disease rounds, and that was the time in which North Central Bronx Hospital was next to Montefiore, and it was a municipal hospital, and these three young men in the intensive care unit who were dying of a respiratory infection, which was unclear, and um, we had heard about um, the, the, uh, the uh, Los Angeles cases, and there was a lot of talk about it going on. Um, in terms of men who have sex with men, it was even called the gay plague. Um, but it was very interesting that these young men were being visited by their parents, by children, by girlfriends or wives. It's really a very different demography. And it led us to actually the question of, could this thing, whatever it is, this infectious disease be transmitted by close casual contact in the family setting? And uh, that became um, a sort of idea that came to fruition with careful epidemiologic studies, which we were able to demonstrate several years later that uh, there's really no evidence for transmission of HIV in that context. Um, probably in the course of the HIV epidemic, the most important thing that I've ever done, because I think it was such a terribly stigmatized disease. And one of the things that, um, empowered the stigma was fear of transmission. And uh, don't go near someone with HIV, you might catch it, don't be in the same room, don't let them work in your 
position in your job, kick them out of your family. And um, um, uh, there, there, there was policy that followed that that enabled actually at least um, um, in legal ways and in school and in employment and in other public health ways, um, uh, the treatment of people living with HIV as anybody else. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Um, I wanted to say that, um, so that was the fir my first encounter, I should say, with it in the Bronx. And it was a very interesting encounter. Those three men died. And, but the context in which they lived was sort of stuck with me for a long time. We were able to actually demonstrate the importance of that initial visit uh, in terms of reducing the stigma in HIV. But I think it's very, very important to appreciate how stigmatized HIV was. And one of the things that I wanted to ask the panel was um, apart from that individual patient and the time, um, there was no system of care for people living with HIV. And we all understood that once we started to recognize the tremendous needs of people living with HIV. And um, so I always like to think that it was disease and the patients who were our teachers in terms of what was needed to be done. And um, in the institutions that you all worked in, you were each, I think, um, responsible for the creation or the helping create of a system of care for people with HIV that really is how we care for people with HIV and other diseases now. So um, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. What were the challenges that, um, and what were the successes that you had in terms of addressing HIV as a clinical entity? Donna? Jerry, I did interrupt. I did, my hearing did not catch. The, did you mention the timely inner city rounds that we have in New York. Sorry, yeah. And see, we suddenly okay. realized that everybody was in the same boat. Yeah, yeah. That so, was clearly going on in New York right. big time. No, thank you. Before you came in, Fred, I mentioned that we represent the Bronx, New Brooklyn and Manhattan, but I neglected that. And that's very, very important. Um, there was a weekly or bi-weekly um, meeting of, of people from different hospitals around the city at the New York City Health Department on Worth Street, I think, and people presented cases of this unknown entity. And um, it, so it was being seen uh, all over the city and um, knowing the incubation period of HIV and we were seeing people with AIDS, you could um, appreciate that the virus had been spreading for probably a decade in, um, in New York City at that time. Um, okay. So oh. having, come from community work, um, that really informed a lot of what I thought about in doing the care. Uh, so in 1990, I came back to Montefiore first as medical director and then director of the Adolescent AIDS Program. And one of the challenges was that, you know, since it, it took about 10 years from infection to um, uh, getting really sick, teenagers were not that sick. So we had to figure out how do we find them, reach out to them, engage them in care before they're really sick. And by that point, it was pretty obvious that we could prevent uh, PCP and certainly treat it if we knew about it early on. And one of the things that I've always felt very sad about was the people who were working with the highest risk adolescents, the homeless kids, um, the gay kids really were very uncomfortable about offering them testing. And I felt like we had a good comprehensive multidisciplinary program that understood and cared about teenagers. We didn't treat them as children or as adults. We had you know, sufficient uh, services for them. We started as the first program. There were others uh, soon in the city, but I don't feel like I ever fully convinced the, um, community providers that testing was important. They, you know, really were 
reluctant to offer testing. They had what they call the plate theory. These kids have too much on their plate already. Um, and I you know, argued that finding out you have HIV would be important. If it was your brother, wouldn't you want them to know? And I think there are a lot of echoes to what happened in COVID with you know, locked in community resistance um, to some of the science of this. And I guess I will never forget it. And, you know, I feel like I had to fight what should have been, you know, the most strong advocate. So having science on your side doesn't always fix it. And that just gets me to one other point, which is the uh, reaction of pediat pediatricians in the late 80s. And one of the things I was a real strong advocate about was using gloves to draw blood. And they didn't want to do that. Um, you know, they were totally terrified of people with HIV and didn't want to deal with them, but they didn't want to take what was a pretty basic uh, protection by wearing gloves when blood drawing. And the argument was, oh, we can't feel the blood vessels as well. And I would say neurosurgeons do brain surgery with gloves on. You, know, you certainly can draw blood. So I think, you know, the other lesson I want to take from that is you know, there's certainly a lot of us, um, and I think almost everyone in this room, who go forward towards an unknown danger, the way COVID was unknown, the way HIV was unknown. But then there's a lot of people, even within our profession, who use, you know, not smart arguments to say why they're not going to do something. So, you know, if you're going to take on an issue like COVID, um, now monkeypox, which I hope we'll get into later, um, be prepared to, you know, be on the edge. And I don't think I always did it well. I think I was too harsh and angry sometimes, but be prepared that it's science is not your only weapon. You have to be an advocate sometimes against uh, who think. Thank you. Happy, you had something to comment? So I do want to share, um, which I did not already do, the first patients I saw living with HIV, although they came in with AIDS, um, in part because it imparts a greater lesson. Um, there, I was a second year resident early in the beginning of my second year. And actually the first person I heard about was presented at a morning report um, and with a sort of classic story that none of us knew yet of residents. It was probably one of the first patients in the hospital, was at North Central Bronx, the city hospital. And um, the person presenting the case reveals near the end that the patient who was a young man confessed to being homosexual. Um, and there was, it, it, there, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia was really strong, much, much more so than now. Um, and it's part of why I think we have to take a long view on how we advocate for change over time. Uh, but the, the patients I took care of, there were two who lived with each other. They were partners, a woman and a man. The man came in first. You may remember this, Jerry. Jerry was my mentor and teacher. And this was on his team. Uh, the man came in with PCP. Uh, we diagnosed it pretty quickly. He went to the ICU and he died. A few days later, his partner and the mother of their baby, babe, an infant, uh, came in um, very short of breath. And I have such a vivid memory of rolling that of rolling her in her bed to the ICU um, where she died of PCP. And um, it turned out that she was um, the first patient accepted by the CDC, by my understanding, Jerry, as heterosexually infected, meaning in the beginning, the stigma was so high that in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, uh, the basically the public health officials were saying these women must be lying about whether they use drugs. They're getting it because they're using drugs. They must be lying, um, and we're not we're not accepting that it was a heterosexually transmitted disease. Uh, so that um, 
it's like COVID. How little, how little did we know? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there were these people called, people considered what was then AIDS the 4-H disease. I don't know if any of you have heard that before. Um, homosexuals, heroin users, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. Haitians. And each one of those carried a stigmatizing connotation to them and made it even harder. Um, so it was really primitive and so poorly understood and so insensitive. And uh, invariably, the sense you had was the victim, quotes, was being blamed. But the question you asked actually was systems of care. I did leave Montefiore and go to Bronx, Lebanon, where my job as a primary care doc was to help develop high quality primary care services. That was in 1988 that um, I moved. And it was around 1988. Uh, and around that time is when HIV became a primary care disease uh, because of AZT. It was the first you know, before that, we, we, we treated very little, prof you know, uh, preventively. I guess we had Bactrim before that. For a little, a couple of years before that, we had Bactrim. Uh, but this, the other thing to realize, the systems of care for the poor in New York City were just horrendous. There was, there wasn't much primary care. It was, it really was episodic care. It, it was very little primary care at all. So the, the part of my job there was to transform a system that delivered poor care to try to make it a, a, an optimal primary care system. And we did then develop a, a specific clinic for people living with HIV uh, that became one of the largest in the city. Sheldon, comments? Yeah, I, I'd like to sort of uh, maybe take you back to the beginning and give you some idea of what I think all of us were dealing with. It was, it was fairly clear, fairly early, probably within three years, I suspect, that we knew we were dealing with a sexually and blood transmissible disease, uh, also perinatally transmitted transmissible disease, which had a very long incubation period. We didn't know it then, but we could very easily see by looking at CD4 cells of the at-risk groups that it probably had gone back at least five years and eventually 10 or even up to, up to 15 years. It was a disease that was spread by acts which were private, instinctual, and pleasurable, and not amenable to the police powers of the state. It was untreatable, we didn't know what it was, and we had nothing to treat it with. And although the CDC at that point in time early said, you may have AIDS, but you don't yet have AIDS. And they made a, uh, in the beginning, an incorrect distinction between, we actually, we didn't even have HIV positivity then. We didn't have that really until late in 1984. So you had this scenario and then we had the reports of it getting into the blood and blood transfusions. And there was a real sense of panic in the country with a disease that could be spread by blood, by sex, by blood transfusions, long incubation period, asymptomatic carriage of it by activities that everybody does and can't be controlled. That was the scenario we had at least for the first five years. And after that, we had the blood test, which both made it better because it allowed us to sort of uh, clean up blood, but unleashed a whole series of, of, of ethical and public health policies as to who should get tested, should we get people tested, what happens if you're positive? <clears throat> Fred, can you elaborate on your feelings about this? this? You just alluded to the fear we didn't know what was going on and it was an asymptomatic infection and an asymptomatic infection didn't scare people until they started to see their colleagues die the bed census at nyu at one point was 200 people in the hospital on a given day with hiv infection uh, about 150 of those were at bellevue and the workload was unimaginable 
uh, simply keep people alive for short periods of time sometimes, like the first patient I illustrated who seemed to be getting better and then within two weeks died, yes. uh, was very stressful. There were no drugs. And we can perhaps talk about some of the angst that we went through to develop drugs because it was not straightforward. I remember having many, many arguments with people at the FDA. Uh, they said that the rules say that you had to demonstrate substantial clinical benefit to release and free up a drug. But we were trying to find out what drugs to do and we didn't even know how to be able to test them. And at this point, David Kessler became head of the FDA. Yes. And he was a hero for us as well as many other things because he allowed us to use a surrogate marker, at least for provisional improvements. Right. And there were hours and hours that went on for one year of statisticians arguing how much of the change in CD4 predicted survival, because survival was a substantial clinical benefit by the FDA rules. And the, what, what part of survival was associated with the change in CD4? I remember sitting through hours of meetings with statisticians as they wrestled with this point by more and more sophisticated analyses that I couldn't begin to understand. Right. But well, ultimately, uh, we did have to figure out, A, how to diagnose it. Shelley says, we didn't measure the virus. We couldn't measure the virus. We were working on CD4 cells. That's right. And they did respond, but that was not sufficient to license the drug if we had one to license. The initial AZT study was done with death as an endpoint and a handful of patients. But you couldn't use a death as an endpoint to screen 40 new compounds. So these were what we were wrestling so, with. I think I have to, um, whoops. <laughs> um, one thing, um, yes, I, it took, well, I guess we, things have moved so fast with COVID as I think um, um, we heard um, from Carlos and the difference between um, the, the timing of the studies and the, and the duration of time that it took to get to where we are with, um, with COVID compared to HIV, which took decades really to have, um, to have effective treatment and all of the time leading up to that was um, really, we had very little to offer in terms of um, treating HIV, although I'd have to say that we became extremely, extremely competent in dealing with these unusual opportunistic diseases that none of us had really seen before, except for tuberculosis, um, and um, able to get people out of the hospital, learn to actually prophylax them so that they could avoid a second event. And um, I extended people's lives at a point in time in which they had um, an ultimately fatal disease. But um, I think one of the things we learned from HIV is that, you know, we really don't cure a lot of diseases. I think you all know that. It might be part of the reason why you've gone into infectious diseases, why I did initially. And HIV was a, um, an affront to that uh, because we thought with antibiotics, we could actually so successfully treat diseases. And that was the attractions. We had to reorient our thinking about what was success and look at success in smaller um, portions um, and also think about quality of life and not just quantity of life. And that became, I think, a mantra for treating people with HIV. And I'm sure that all of you know that in your own practices. And one of the very special things about HIV is the relationship that we develop with uh, people living with HIV, particularly since we can do that over a long period of time. Um, can I ask um, Sheldon about the H's, the four H's, because you were in Brooklyn where there was a huge population of people from Haiti. And what was that like? Well, uh, we published one of those studies sure. on, on uh, heterosexual transmission among persons of Haitian, Haitian origin. Uh, I think I was hung in effigy uh, after the study was, uh, was published. Um, it turns out that it was... Um, 
they, they probably were heterosexual, but in fact, the disease was widespread in the Caribbean. And obviously many other reports came out quickly about uh, HIV disease in, uh, in Africa and, and, and throughout the world. Um, many of the organized communities uh, ran away from, from dealing with prevention, uh, whether it be the Haitian community, whether it be the black conservative churches, we couldn't get them involved in prevention because of the stigma that was associated with it. And the feeling was that this was giving them and their group a bad name, which, which, which made, made prevention uh, um, more, more difficult. Um, I will say that there was another issue, which is how you treat people who are HIV positive, which, uh, it's hard to give you a sense of the intensity of, of, of the debates in terms of public policy and ethics that went on at, 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 at that point in time. Um, whether it be testing, whether it be if a person is test positive, do they get health insurance, do they not? And actually there are some fairly nasty uh, articles uh, written out. There was, there was a call that we should treat HIV disease like every other STD and that we should round them up and treat them. But of course, we couldn't treat them because we didn't know what it was or how, 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 how to treat them. And I do remember an article that was published, I believe in the Wall Street Journal way back when, where the author said, uh, uh, gay men have made war on nature and nature has made war back against them. And this, this was part of the prevailing, the prevailing issues that, that, we, uh, that was faced at that point in, in time. So I think having said that, I think one of the things um, that has been very special about HIV that is new is, uh, is the role of communities rising up that is activism, um, um, imperiled communities not waiting for something to happen, but taking action in, it, in their hands. And that's been what's characterized HIV and now moved into other diseases. So as health professionals not directly involved with that, we became allies, mm -hmm. but working on different fronts. And I think um, the speed in which antiretroviral therapy became available, although it was slow, the, um, the uh, care available for people living with HIV, um, at least in part, but in large measure, had a lot to do with actually the role of activism. Right. And, um, and so um, that's an alliance that I think is very powerful, not just for HIV AIDS, but other diseases. And one of the really byproducts and benefits from this terrible disease. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, since you all worked in institutions and you'd mentioned them, um, uh, what was the response of your institution and the people who you worked with, not just the people who were attracted to HIV in terms of this new disease and now um, this institution having to deal with it? Mm -hmm. And um, so who would like to take that on? Yeah. Oh, okay, Donna, yeah. go on, Donna. Um, I hate to be super critical, but... Um, my chair in pediatrics said, don't have this as your career. It'll ruin you. It's a dead end. You won't go anywhere with it. He saw HIV in children as just a combination of a nothing burger and a terrible choice. And um, we built our clinic 100% uh, on grants, and the grants were care grants. We got... Uh, HHS uh, had a Ryan White program that funded us well for comprehensive care. We had grants from New York City and state, as well as research grants from NIH. And because we had such a robust portfolio of grants, it gave us a certain power and in a way an escape from the department because we didn't need their money and we could you know, do things and we had a national reputation. And I think um, some of that strength really was threatening to a lot of people. Um, you know, people wanted in, they wanted in on our money. They, you know, while they were also, you know, highly um, uncomfortable with the patients that we were taking care of. Um, Montefiore Pediatrics, you know, also takes care of primarily black and Latino 
patients, which was our patients um, later, um, but our kids were mostly gay and a lot of them, you know, didn't fit into the pediatric idea and we needed to, you know, take care of them as they got older, which also made people uncomfortable. So there was a presumption that, you know, the nice families that were in pediatrics would be offended by our patients. And that was, you know, tripled by, you know, the last five to 10 years of expanding our practice to take care of trans and gender nonconforming young people who, you know, wanted the kind of care we were presenting. So early on, I went to one of the AIDS conferences and there was a poster about working with stigmatized populations. You become stigmatized as a provider. And I think, you know, there was definitely a lot of that. I was openly gay. So I think, you know, people were pretty uncomfortable with that as well. So I would, I mean, I love the work, but I feel like I got most of my support and energy from both the patients who were really hard at times, as well as my um, city and national, and then later international community. Uh, when I began working in South Africa, we went to, uh, provide streamlined testing for HIV in public health clinics. And that was also very challenging because nobody in South Africa really wanted white people coming in to tell them what they w should do after apartheid. And there was no real discussion about all of these issues about equity and racism. And when I would bring up racism, you know, within my program, as well as in the department, you know, leaders would say to me, that's for your study group. That has nothing to do with medicine. Um, so I think, you know, we've become a lot more sophisticated and open, but there's a backlash. And don't think, you know, just because you see the equity issues and racism, that people are going to stick with that and support it for a long time, because uh, I'm not sure that they will. Fred, what was it like at Bellevue, the great... Um um, a storied institution, the history of medicine, and the um, the uh, uh, um, what, what would the word be the the um, the place where people went if they had no other place to go. What was the response of the administration and the institution, and were the people who were interested in Here's HIV a disease? A question I can I can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> This is, what was the response of Bellevue? What was the response of Bellevue to, to the epidemic? Yeah, uh, the response of Bellevue to HIV was, I think, quite an admirable one. Uh, we are the hospital of last resort, as are all of the HHC hospitals. Yes. Yes. NYU itself was not very receptive to HIV. And uh, it was a wide open secret that our dean said, we don't want NYU to become an HIV hospital. Right. At Bellevue things, you had the usual anxiety about infection. Uh, some nurses were afraid. One of the most influential papers, Jerry, came from you in easing this phrase. And that was the study of families that saved the same, say, used the same toothbrush and did not transmit. I have used that a thousand times in talking to people. Uh, it was an important concept. Uh, we uh, also, in my lab, were, were growing up buckets of HIV because we were studying it. <laughs> and we instituted some lab safety very much. Initially, we, we did not even have biohazard hoods. And I was culturing with bare hands uh, very carefully. Uh, we then got biohazard hoods. We adopted the CDC regulations. We went one step further. In tissue culture, you traditionally put antibiotics and antifungal agents in your So We said, if we're gonna have sloppy technique, we're gonna pick it up by a bacterial contamination. We stopped using antibiotics in our long-term tissue cultures just to ensure that everybody worked very safely. And we did. And we had one needle stick that I, in years and years, which was immediately handled with no problem. Uh, so safety was a concern. Bellevue itself responded. HHC put money into this. Uh, in fact, they paid one of my colleagues, Bob Holzman, to go out and look at Paul Wolverding set up in California to see how we could deal with this onslaught of patients. And he helped right. a great deal. 
Uh, so Bellevue responded and, and the city, city responded, I think very nicely. Sheldon, would you agree from down, yeah, downstairs in Kings County? The answer is um, the Health and Hospitals Corporation did. It, it took a little while. Our first clinic was uh, on the fourth floor walk up with three rooms they gave us using uh, some staff I had from, from other antibiotic drug, uh, uh, drug programs, drug grants, okay? <laughs> But I remember eventually, I think it was Dr. Bobby Cohn, who was vice president, and Joe Abby Buford, who was president. They allocated uh, teams to each hospital, depending upon how many HIV patients you had. And you had one or two support staff, a nurse practitioner or a PA, and one or two doctors uh, per X number of teams. We got two or three teams. I'm sure you got the same number of, uh, of teams that we, um, that we had to sort of set up uh, set up clinical uh, services for the, uh, for the patient. Good. So my impression was um, that many of the private hospitals or the not-for-profit hospitals um, did not want to consider themselves as places where there were people with AIDS. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as you said, the municipal hospitals, the um, in all the boroughs actually responded responsibly and, um, with fewer resources. Well, if I could tell you a, a story about that. Um, after 1985, just well, late 84, just before the HIV test became licensed, we were working with NIH on it. And uh, we had decided to see how many of our patients on the wards were infected. So we did an anonymous voluntary uh, blood draw on all the patients on one day on the HIV, uh, on the general medicine ward. Uh, and we sent them off to NIH and got back our results. At around the same time, the president of the medical center who had been ignoring the problem finally realized we really had to deal with it because they felt the applications to the medical school, applications to the residency, people didn't want to come to New York to do their medical training because of it. Um, we're going down. Okay, and he convened a, a, a conference or a meeting, a scientific meeting to sort of discuss the implications. Uh, and I was the head of the scientific committee. He opened up the meeting by saying, well, we have to confront this problem. We don't want to become an AIDS hospital. And then he asked me to start the meeting. And I said, uh, Mr. President, uh, we are you, an AIDS hospital. 70, 70% 70, 70 of the patients on the wards are HIV positive. You are an AIDS hospital. It's not something that's different from the days when the hospitals were TB hospitals, were staff hospitals, were polio hospitals. We just have to deal with it. Right. At, at Bellevue, once we set up a separate HIV service with separate dedicated nursing staff yes. and with an intention on the attendings to put our best teachers on that service, the house staff loved to go to that service. Yeah. I think we had the same experience at Montefiore in North Central Bronx, and we uh, developed a multidisciplinary team, which included social workers, clergy, because most of our people who we cared for were deeply religious, much more so than the doctors who were caring for them. <laughs> and that was very important. I would walk into a room, and if I saw a Bible on which you often would, I would ask people, what are they reading and why? And so we had a clergy Reverend Davenport joined our team and make rounds. Um, all of this was very, very important in terms of, again, the quality of life of people living with HIV. Yes. We should comment that, I mean, I agree as an adult, a, a physician taking care of adults at Montefiore, I felt well supported. And that was particularly true also at Bronx, Lebanon, where 25% of all inpatients uh, were were hospitalized because of HIV during the heavy years. Um, but we should comment on what New York State Medicaid did because it changed what the hospitals did, I felt, and both for the outpatient setting and the inpatient setting, which is they changed the, the reimbursement structure in a way that hospitals didn't lose so much money or maybe could break even. And it therefore encouraged the multiple hospitals to assume much more care and put in much better outpatient facilities uh, for people living with HIV. Yeah, Nick, Nick Rango took over the, 
New York yes, State Department of uh, Health right. on that. You combine the public health aspects and the reimbursement yep. aspects, Zero. which made HIV a money maker for the hospitals, uh, which is why we managed to get more resources going forward. Um, and, and I think that was also true with COVID. You know, you really see the impact of politics and funding on what we are able to do medically. And I think, you know, us being mm -hmm. in alliance and then getting good people in, you know, we had four years of a horrible response to health problems, but, you know, the leadership really makes a difference and also gets constrained by politics. So we should right. mention ACT UP. Yes. There's a well, reason said, ACT UP existed. No, right. active, <laughs> activism was absolutely yeah. critically important in the response to HIV AIDS. And again, the communities imperiled actually taking matters in their own hands. Mm -hmm. A new event, I think, in healthcare and history and um, critically, critically important. We honor them, they're our colleagues, we love them uh, and still work together. Um, Can I just say one thing about the Haitian issue? Yes. Um, the, I just wanna recommend if people haven't seen it, an incredible article in the New York Times about two weeks ago about right. why Haiti was so impoverished, the first island or the first place in the Americas to overthrow slavery and, uh, um, France charged them reparations for overthrowing slavery and then made them take out unfavorable bank loans. But I knew the story of Haiti being corrupt and that's why it was so poor. But this upends this and tells the real story why Haiti went from being the richest colony to the poorest place in the Americas. And I think that you know really affected why that community was hit with HIV. Jonathan Mann said, you know, that HIV exposes the, you know, poorest, most vulnerable yeah. communities and nations. And I think COVID did the same thing. Uh, so I think pandemics always, always expose the flaws and widens them in societies. And uh, it's actually a good time to segue to COVID. And what so does the panel think we learned in the years of HIV that has been relevant and important in terms of confronting the next pandemic that we now have? Well, that, that, that's a complicated question. Of course. That a complicated answer. Um, if you look at the, the response on, on, on a national level uh, or on a, on a state level, it was highly varied it was deeply uh, involved with stigma of, of, of the population um, and public health and, and communication was all. Communication was central to both some of the early mistakes or, or misapplication of the science, uh, but also to ultimately getting it, getting it, getting it, uh, getting it right. There was a, a caution about sort of giving out to the population what the real potential threat of this was. Uh, and, and there was always a caveat for every announcement, uh, but you can see how even now the CDC has been very cautious in what it says and what it does. And because they, they, they play an enormous role in, uh, in shaping the, the broad general response uh, to, the, uh, to the epidemic. We were very lucky early on with some of the people in the CDC who were working there. Really, You're talking about COVID now or? Uh, uh, well, no, I was talking about uh, HIV. HIV. Uh, uh, um, but, but not surprising there, not surprisingly, there are always, there are always missteps. One has to be generous in one's judgment on, 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 on these things. And there were also um, folks or people who, who, um, um, so after there were the blood cases that came out, there were some very senior blood banking people who said, this is not really a blood disease, it's something else. Yeah. And, for, and for a long time or for a significant amount of time, they, they didn't buy into that and screening programs slowed down. So, so um, Sheldon, what is the lesson from HIV that applies to well, COVID well, well, in this? Well, the lesson from, you sort of have to, um, you have to pay attention to the science. I mean, okay. I mean, I, I mean, I think, I think that was a lesson, uh, and you have to. That that was missed in some of the areas uh, okay. on the blood issue, uh, on some of the issues with hemophiliacs. Uh, 
you have to pay attention to the science because you, you Fred, don't want you're to... a basic scientist I started out as one what do so, you think I think there's been a lot <clears throat> or there's a lot <clears throat> a lot in the press at the time about the slowness of the government response uh, and uh, there is a scientific something that was amusing those of us who had an NIH grad to do lab work obviously stopped I stopped looking at basic lymphocyte function and started looking at lymphocyte function in HIV infected people. And several scientists got a call from their study section at the NIH saying, we've been reading your progress report and we see that you're working on this new entity, this new infectious immunodeficiency. And I said, yes, and so forth. And about 40 days after that phone call, the NIH gave out an announcement because there was on her front pressure from the public. We are already spending X number of million dollars on this because they had read our progress reports right. and labs on throughout the country with I think investigators initiation were studying this. So, uh, then to Tony Fauci did in a call a meeting to, with the question of whether we should set up a clinical trials unit to quickly evaluate drugs. And that was a wise decision. Are you talking about HIV or COVID or both? That was about an 885, I think. Okay, it took, right. it took that okay. long. I so that's the lesson, year, isn't it? it was 86 Get quickly before. into the science. Yeah, so there were a number of years lapsed when you were funding it out of other funds, basically. Okay. And what about working with communities? Something that we learned to do with HIV. How does that apply? How does that play out with COVID, our next a new pandemic? I missed that question. Uh, 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 how do work communities play out with COVID versus HIV? Uh, oh. I just want to go well, back to the other question for a quick second. Um, what did we learn? I, in a way, was surprised at how little we learned. Um, okay. You know, we really needed um, mobilization. And in a way, HIV was off to the side because it was populations that people, you know, was it never really became a general population disease, I don't think. Uh, but COVID, we weren't sure where it was going. And I think, um, you know, the lack of addressing COVID, I mean, the fact that healthcare providers did not have adequate uh, masks and gowns and things like that was just shocking that we weren't ready to do that. So you know, part of the lesson was, you know, how important politics and community mobilization is to getting effective health services. Um, and just segueing to monkeypox where, you know, for a lot of reasons, and I think it's very similar to HIV, it landed in the gay community. And there are certain practices and behaviors, parties, uh, a much more sexually liberated um, ethos that, encourage transmission of this virus. And um, I think I was just, I've been very shocked at how stigma has sort of ruled and prevented us from giving simple and accurate messages. The idea of intimate contact and the inability to say sexual contact, because you know I know so many people who think, can I hug my sister? And then be careful, what does that mean? So I would have thought we would have learned much better lessons from HIV about health communication. And yes, there's a balance between exacerbating stigma and um, giving the community the message. But one of the problems in HIV was that the community did not get messages. Our president Reagan didn't say the word HIV. The New York Times didn't cover it. So the A I, word. What? The A word. The A word, AIDS. And, you know, in some ways, I think we all coasted on, you know, the lessons had been learned, just like we coasted on, oh, we have abortion rights. But no, there's this huge backlash right now that is taking away a lot of the rights. And I don't, you know, they had the right wing had a long term game uh, that we didn't. And so, in some ways, what are the lessons we've learned? We can't give up so easy. You know, COVID is not over. I think um, Carlos said that at the end of his talk. You know, we want things to be better quickly. And that's, I don't think that's the lesson we can take. Yeah, I think giving information to the activists was critical. And we would 
we'd have small meetings basically before you had to have community advisor it was small meetings of people who were interested they're smart some of them were reading the basic science literature and they were our community yes and we explained as much as we understood about the disease particularly the point that you just made reminding people even today that you can get reinfected so the idea of cohorting with other infected people is not sufficient and we still see reinfections. Yes. But also and, being uh, an activist. Which complicates a lot of these long-term studies, by the way. <laughs> but part of what happened in HIV is we became activists, or we already were activists and we directed our activism in this way. It's not just ACT UP. I mean, ACT UP occurred in great part because of the Reagan administration's refusal, refusal to deal on a systematic level with the HIV epidemic. Uh, but we sort of became inside the system molds, and 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 that's how that's how the women's study occurred, the women's interagency HIV study, from which we learned a lot about how HIV infects women, uh, who were a group early in the epidemic, who were really shunted to the side for a variety of reasons. But uh, what I uh, the parallel, I one of the parallels I see between the um, HIV and the COVID pandemic is for uh, the healthcare system and for providers. That although it happened much more slowly in HIV and it happened on a, a time warp speed for COVID was this complete reorganization of the healthcare system in order to accommodate the sudden um, increased numbers of patients needing care and needing care right now or they were going to die. Uh, the other thing was the trauma that um, providers experienced. I was not an inpatient provider during COVID. In fact, I was, I was sick in the beginning of the COVID epidemic, probably with COVID. And the, um, but it was so extreme, the, the death, especially in New York early. Now that may have happened in other parts of the country later, because it when it looked like they were having the same kind of onslaught into their hospitals and ICUs. Uh, but the, I really think some providers have PTSD, uh, that it's, um, we need to, and, and actually one word of, I always say to other doctors is let yourself cry. You know, this scene, yeah. this much death is very, very hard, especially if you want to keep being a good doc, which means putting yourself there in the patient's place uh, and, and yet being able to protect yourself enough that you don't collapse in grief. I think that's a wonderful um, a point to stop for a moment and ask the audience um, listening to us talk about the past and we're all living in the present, um, ask us questions or provide comments to us about what we actually said we have. We decided to start a little bit earlier so that people would be able to stay rather than leave at the earlier time if we had a break. So there's an opportunity to hear from you and I think we'd like to. So we, I think it, you can use the system to provide um, questions. Uh, we will try to Slido. Use Slido. I don't know how to do it, so let me tell. <laughs> there's no there's no Not on. Yeah. So you can use Slido. What? Oh. Well, we're while we're waiting, let me ask another question then waiting for yours. Um, so now we're in our second pandemic and since the world has changed so much and we have become so much closer to other living forms that are likely to pass other infectious agents to us and we're all anticipating that there's going to be another pandemic, certainly in our lifetime and in our careers. 
what have we learned from COVID that might prepare us for the next pandemic? Uh, she, she's on her way. She's on her way. Okay. Jerry, you want to try that one? You can. We don't have a microphone, but if you have a microphone, we'll bring one. Yeah, you can send the mic. Um, Jerry, I, I can, I think, part answer that question. Okay. Well, I, I want to hear from the audience if anyone has a question. Anyone? Comment. Yeah. A comment? We also can't see their screen. Yes, please. Hi. Hey, Jeff, Brooklyn's in the house. On an observation. Well, it's a comment and a question. Um, uh, yeah, I think one has a sense that COVID has taken all the oxygen out of the air. And because it's it's been so broad, as was said, it was so rapid and everything about it is so fast as the rest of our lives are. And um, uh, it's hard to catch your breath, but... Um, uh, I think we're the ones who have to advocate and continue for HIV. Fortunately, the structures exist. They exist in all of our institutions. The resources re exist. We heard today about the future in terms of therapy and the utilization of drugs and prevention. I mean, the work has been going on and there is a population of all of us who are working in so many different levels. So I don't think that um, it will be lost. I think um, resources are, you know, uh, um, not as plentiful as they might be, but I think that we have to, I think it's a very good point. We have to continue to advocate strongly for HIV and not be completely consumed by COVID and the Ukraine war and so many other things that are happening around us. But for our patients, and I can say I work also globally in South Africa for people in many, many parts of the world, HIV is still much, much more um, critically important than COVID in terms of um, it's an ultimately fatal disease without treatment, as we know, whereas most people, even in high prevalence areas of COVID survive and go on. So um, uh, and, it, and it takes away the lives of productive people at the young, young and productive age. So it's critically important economically. Um, but I think that's a very, very important question. We should be actually actively discussing that. How do we preserve what we have in the context of this and other pandemics? And I'm really glad you asked that question. Jeff, um, I, I felt like before COVID, there was a little bit of a shift in the progressive medical students and um, residents to international work. You know, it used to be people, you know, of that caliber really, you know, went into HIV and AIDS and then they started doing international work and not just in HIV and AIDS. And I feel like one of the lessons is people, all of us and systems have a short attention span. And, you know, we want things to be over. We want to move on. People are always into the new, new. That's what's sexy. That's what's appealing. And, you know, to me, okay, it was fun for all of us to talk about our, you know, old experiences, but I'm not sure that's going to keep people's attention. I feel like um, it's going to be more the, 
sort of big lessons about people, you know, we really made a lot of progress about homophobia. We made, you know, more recently, it's, I don't think we've made progress, but we certainly have brought attention to racism and health inequities. And I feel like if we can bring those lessons forward as opposed to a specific disease model, you know, I think we have to keep advocating for people to do this yeah. work, for funding to still be there, um, you know, but I feel like, you know, maybe the heart and interest of people is gonna, you know, be more in the sort of topics surrounding it. And, you know, monkeypox is, you know, we have are now faced with the exact same challenges of do you, you know, talk about it and give people warnings or do you not, you know, promote stigma? Boy, that was a AIDS 101 early 80s conversation. Uh, so, you know, we can learn from where we've been, but I'm not sure the, um, I wish it was that we could bring people into our field more, but I'm but not I, sure I'm that's not, the one. I, okay. I, I have a different perspective. I, I, well, first of all, internationally, by which I mean all the international people, not the Americans, um, going to do international work, I think there's still a very strong focus on HIV. I think it's taken a hit because of COVID, but um, I, I think the transformation of healthcare systems in, um, in uh, low, of resources. lower income countries, uh, yeah, exactly, a, a redistribution of resources. The, the other thing I see as hopeful is the increased attention on stigma that we are not going to control the HIV epidemic ultimately unless we can mitigate substantially the stigma that populations are experiencing. And I see um, lots of young researchers stepping up to uh, investigate ways in which we can reduce stigma. Um, now, a lot of my work is done internationally. In fact, all my new research is done internationally, but I, I work with a, a group who do a lot of um, research in the United States, and the funding agencies are funding um, research to about ways to prevent HIV infection. So in, in terms of HIV, I, I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful that we will beat it in my lifetime not my working lifetime but my <laughs> lifetime yours not mine yeah. <laughs> sheldon the comment um in response to jeff's uh comment and observation and question i, I think there really has been a a decrease in the intensity and it's become more focal, sort of like a, an abscess that's, that has come together only in a positive way around people. <laughs> what what an analogy. <laughs> uh, I will say that in the beginning, uh, folks who, who went into HIV disease were a self-selected group who felt it was interesting, important, exciting, fundable, good for careers. That, that's a truth, but I guess all of us up here are uh, 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 part of that. There were others earlier on who didn't want to have anything to do with it, anything to do with it. I, mean, I remember I, I couldn't get our micro department to do a bit uh, on it. I think it's a bit different now, but people are eagerly jumping in, into, in, into COVID and related things and a recognition, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, climate change is going to make this sort of problem, you know, normalized uh, in, in the upcoming years, not in my life, <laughs> but yeah, certainly in, in, in others, um, to sort of realize that, that these sorts of epidemic infections are gonna be coming more and more and more and yeah. more. And I think one of the lessons we've learned coming back to your question, uh, 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 Jerry, and that one of the things we've learned is that we really have to plan for surge capacity. That all hospitals now, have plans for emergency surge capacity in a better way than we had them before. That was a useful yes, lesson. It's true that we have. So, uh, we commented about the attitudes of the hospitals. Yes. Did, I will say this, that the comment that the faculty response was terrific. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the oncologists who were studying capacities and working out some details in lymphomas that they had never worked out before. The endocrinologists were working out why all the CMV destroying the adrenals. The ophthalmology, every service pitched in and put their talents to the HIV complications. And it was really quite, quite wonderful. It's an academic response. These people yes. did have the curiosity. They weren't not gonna let this go by. They're gonna figure it out. Yeah, though, well, I, yes, I think uh, in every specialty, there was some, not most, who were, uh, who like us, I think ran towards HIV AIDS. There's still many who avoided it. And um, at least in the institutions I've worked at, but, um, but there are always people who, um, in, who, who were interested. Yes, and I don't actually see us in, um, as the sort of, heroes and heroines. I think that we were compelled for personal reasons and for professional reasons to be attracted to HIV. And many people were repelled by it. I think the real heroes and heroines are those who didn't actually see HIV as the great personal, um, um, can I say, um, uh, attraction, but actually, were in the path of the epidemic, are in the path of the epidemic, and did what they are obliged to do as healthcare workers and doctors. And those are the real heroes and heroines in my mind. And that actually represents the majority of healthcare workers. And that is, this is what we're taught to do, and this is what we do. And um, so I, um, I consider us sort of a special cohort of that group. But um, most of our colleagues have um, it, it has re behaved responsibly as professionals. It's about, it's about stepping up. Yes. Right? You step up. Yes. And yeah. No, I think that's who we are. And, and ultimately it's about, you know, medicine is about the people's health. In fact, all, all public money that's going into research or medical care, or education, ultimately it's about the people's health. Right. And the people were dying, both in the HIV epidemic and in COVID, so you step up. So can I ask for some questions? I don't have a question. Right there. Don't can be you shy. Project? Can you stand up and you can stand up yell. or you can put it on, on, on your... Huh. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last thing you said. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. Yes. Yeah. 
Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Thank you. Yes. Some of that's about money, right? Um, in fact, besides New York Medicaid, um, which is the Ryan White Care Act, allows us to, to put that into our systems. And, and yeah, the social determinants of health are, the more we can address those, the better we will get at reaching the populations of people with HIV who are not who do not currently have a suppressed viral load. So I, I totally agree with what you've said. Um, and I, I think we can draw forth, um, and this is related to Jeff's point, but I think we can really draw forth huge lessons about the systems of care we built. You know, they did address, we didn't know, use those words, but they did address social determinants of health. We knew we couldn't have a clinic and get people to come regularly unless we looked at you know, reminders and transportation and health insurance and translation. And I think, you know, if we can draw forth um, some of those lessons and, you know, ask for them to be part of the funding mix and what is covered, I think, you know, those are some of the incredibly important lessons of HIV. I couldn't hear everything you were saying, but I think you were sort of arguing for addressing some of those issues in our current systems of care and i i think that's crucial and how do we you know get a um a sufficient mass and energy to do that because it took a lot of activism and advocacy to make that happen and you know Yes. Yeah. Actually, that was a big, a big question uh, a couple of years ago, especially about the issue of are we spending too much money on age and neglecting breast cancer and colon cancer and all the rest. That that that, that was a debatable question. Uh, years ago. I think. Uh, Th thanks for your comments and questions. I wanted to, um, we're going to come to a close because we um, started this session uh, half an hour earlier. We close earlier and it's approaching four. Um, I'm going to ask the panel if they have any other final comments um, related to what I hope has been an informative and um, um, useful and um, historical conversation about the, um, the illness that we're all uh, disease, about the social conditions that, um, that uh, breed it, that we're all very, very committed to in our work and I would say probably in our personal lives. Um, so um, uh, I'm gonna ask the panel for final comments. Any? <laughs> Well, you warned us you would ask this question. My, my, my comments are very brief. Um, keep trying to make a difference. Take a long view because the change comes slow. Excellent.
It's sort of taking off on something that I interpreted from Jerry about who are the healers, uh, I mean, heroes. I, I think the questions you were just asking are really crucial. The need to be humble, to question our own practice, resources, is it all fair? Um, we have to keep being able to ask those questions and challenge ourselves. And, you know, the second part, I think it's part of what Kathy was talking about, that we have to keep advocating for, you know, fairness and equity and not just in HIV and AIDS, but across, um, you know, the whole spectrum of healthcare that we're in. Right. This symposium has demonstrated what you're supposed to do when you see something you've never seen before. And all of us in any branch of medicine, but particularly infectious diseases, are going to see things that you've never seen before. That's the fun of infectious diseases. It's also the challenge. And I think everybody has to be alert, be ready to be surprised. Don't try to put round pegs in square holes. It may be something different. Think, be critical. And if you see something you don't understand, figure out how to solve it. Don't just say we don't know about that. Rather, we must find out about that. Thank you, Fred. So I think I'll just echo Fred's comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, um, so I'd like, to, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you for our panel. Thank you, Gary. and friends. Thank you all. Travel safely home and healthy and um, look forward to next year's person-in-person uh, -person meeting again. And to all those who were attending virtually, thank you so much for attending. And I hope that this was useful wherever you've heard us from and seen us. Thank you so much. <laughs>